Happy Mother's Day to all of you who are moms. We certainly celebrate you. Thank you for your sacrifices. Thank you for your love. Scripture tells us that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice, but also mourn with those who mourn. And I just want to acknowledge, this is also a really hard day because it's Mother's Day for a lot of women. So if that's your situation, we just pray that the grace of God would be with you as well. My name is Perry. I'm one of the pastors here at the Boulder campus. And we are going to be in Nehemiah chapter 8 this morning. I invite you to go ahead and turn there. If you don't have a Bible, please use one of the Pew Bibles, and we just got new Pew Bibles, so they're ready for you to use. If you don't have a Bible of your own, please take that. That's our gift to you. If you don't have a Bible, we would love for you to have one now. But Nehemiah chapter 8 is where we are, and we've seen in these past few weeks how Nehemiah is very much a book about security, and security is very much a part of our lives. The human heart longs for security. We might think about physical security and the global home security industry, the industry that provides cameras and sensors and alarms for our homes was valued at $50.6 billion or something like that back in 2021. But by 2030, it's projected to more than double to $106 billion. Why? Because we love security. Financial security is another aspect of security that we might think of. We just had a class called Financial Peace University, and at Financial Peace, they define security this way in a financial sense. Reaching a point where you're so secure with your money that you're living without debt, paying your monthly expenses, investing for retirement, keeping money in the bank for emergencies, it's having the confidence that you can survive financially even when the unexpected hits. Doesn't that sound nice? Why? Because we love security. The whole insurance industry is built off of that three-word phrase, peace of mind. Just another form of security. Psychologists even talk about emotional security, where in a social setting, we feel comfortable to express ourselves and to be who we are. We love security. Security is deeply embedded as a desire inside of all of our hearts. And in the book of Nehemiah, in these past few weeks, we've seen their commitment to rebuild a wall around the city of Jerusalem. Why? So that it might be secure. It's been a remarkable scene that we have read about in these past weeks. We've seen not just the construction element, but we've seen the opposition that they faced. They had enemies who did not want them to complete the task. We also saw last week in chapter 5 how even internally within their own community, they faced strife together. But in chapter 6, verse 15, we read about this momentous time where it says, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard of it, the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Wouldn't it be awesome to be a part of a work That when people looked at what we're a part of, they would say, only the hand of God could have done that. Let me give you a quick update from last week, our 6-8 project. We had over 70 people who signed up to help out with some of our local strategic partners. That includes University Hill Elementary School, where we mentor students, we pray for students, we help support the faculty there, the teachers, the staff. We also have projects with Habitat for Humanity that some of you signed up for, building homes in this local area for underprivileged families. We also had a project that we're going to be taking part of in the Boulder Safe House. We're helping people in our community who are vulnerable, and over 70 of you jumped in to do that. That was remarkable. We also had over 3,000 pounds of food that were donated, over 1.4 tons of food. The food bank, again, was just blown away by your generosity. These are just little things, just one way where we might be a part of a work that's like this, where people would look at it and say that I see people there, but only God could accomplish something like that. So the wall goes up in just over seven weeks of time, but the task isn't over, it's not done. Because in chapter 7, Nehemiah has to appoint officials to oversee Jerusalem's security, and in to try to establish procedures to open and close the gates to make sure it's done in the right way. And this is what we read in chapter 7. It says, And I said to these people who I appointed, Let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot, 
And while they're still standing guard, let them shut and bar the doors. Appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, some at their guard posts, some in front of their own homes. The city was wide and large, but the people within it were few, and no houses had been rebuilt. A city without walls is a dangerous place, but even a city with walls can still be a dangerous place if it doesn't have enough people inside of it. And that's the issue here. Jerusalem is a big area, and even though the walls are now completed, there aren't enough people in the city to adequately protect it. So the rest of chapter 7 is Nehemiah's quest to decide who should live inside of the city of Jerusalem. He, he finds a list of all of the people that had come out of exile back to the area years earlier, and he consults that to try to decide who should resettle in the city. Okay, it's over. What should we study next? <laughs> now, obviously, the task isn't over. We're now, we're now going from rebuilding a wall to rebuilding a people's faith. We're now shifting from rebuilding a wall to reorienting their worship. Matters of brick and mortar to now matters of hearts and minds. They have been so committed to this rebuilding and now they are about to shift their commitment in a beautiful way, in a way that we're going to see and they are going to see where true security comes from. Let's look now at chapter 8 of Nehemiah. It says this, starting off in verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. Okay, let's just pause right here. God's hand had been among the people as they had rebuilt the wall in a way that even people who didn't worship God had to acknowledge. But now we see God's hand at work in an equally remarkable way, even if it's less detectable to those outside the walls. They are all gathering together as one in a quest to listen to the word of God. What an amazing thing. And we don't really know exactly who all of the people are, how many they are, but if you look at the list that Ezra consulted or that Nehemiah consulted, rather, in the previous chapter and that that is also in Ezra chapter 2, you see that the total number of people in their community who came out of exile back to the Jerusalem area was 42,360 people. We should not imagine a small little gathering of a couple dozen or even a couple hundred people. This could be tens of thousands of people who are gathered together in one place with a quest to be able to understand God's word. And it says that they take the initiative. They're the ones. They told Ezra the scribe. They told Ezra the priest to bring the law before the assembly. Ezra is a man who's introduced to us for the first time here, but In his book, in Ezra's book, Ezra chapter 7, we read about him there as somebody who is descended from the lineage of Aaron, who's the the brother of Moses. So Aaron is a priest of the priestly line of Israel. And it says there that God's hand was on him and that Ezra has set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to, to teach its statutes and its rules in Israel. Ezra is a man for this moment. Ezra is a man who's well prepared and he's the kind of guy who you would normally find in the temple. But here, Ezra is out in the streets because the word of God is not just for the sanctuary. The word of God is for the streets. It's for the community. And Ezra goes in this square out in the open before this area called the water gate and it's both men and women and all who could understand are gathered there. The phrase, all who could understand, is code for children. We see generations here together. Back in the law, back in the book of Deuteronomy, we read in chapter 6, in a very famous, important chapter of the Bible, we read about 
how the law is something that is supposed to be passed down from one family, one generation to the next. It says this in verse 6. And these words that I command you today, this is Moses speaking, shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The word of God is meant for the community. It's meant to be out into the streets, not only here in a place like this room this morning, but the word of God is something that informs all of our lives and it's for all people. The first thing we see here is they've gone from a commitment to rebuild the wall to now a commitment to listen to God's word. This is rhetorical. Do you think collectively that we have that same level of commitment to listen to God's word today? We live in a place where there's a lot of noise. We live in a day where there are a lot of voices in the crowd, not just the word of God that's speaking to us. We have our notifications, we have our breaking news, we have our social media posts, we have all kinds of things that vie for our time and our attention. Our schedules are very busy, they're very full. And in all of that, God's word can just get crowded out in our minds. But if we go on and we look at verse 3, it says this, Ezra read from, this, read from the law, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, for hour after hour, in the presence of the men, the women, and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. One thing we can say about our day is that while it's noisy, we also have an unprecedented level of access to God's word. Right? We can have it on our phones. We can have it in multiple translations that we might take with us. We can listen to it in the shower. We can do it, listen to it while we're doing dishes. We can go on a hike or our commute and listen to God's word. We live in this day that is unlike any day before us where we have this open access to God's word in our own English language. It's a wonderful thing. But the first commitment we see from them is a commitment to listen to God's word. But a commitment to listen to God's word doesn't do us a lot of good if we don't also understand it. Let's keep reading. It says, And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Maasiah on his right hand, and Padiah, Mishael, Malchijah, Hashum, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Mashulam on his left hand. I had to practice that. <laughs> and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And he opened it, and all the people stood, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen. They lifted up their hands, and they bowed their heads, and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And Yeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Maasiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, the Levites, Help the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. The word understood shows up six different times in this passage because it's not enough to just listen to God's word. We also need to understand it. And we see from what's written here with all of those names, those two lists of 13 names, that understanding God's word is a group effort. It's a community project. We don't know exactly who those 13 are who are standing up there with Ezra on the platform. Perhaps they are other religious officials, maybe Levites, but they're not identified as Levites, which leads a lot of people to, to just speculate that maybe they're just normal lay people, just people from the community who are there to help read from the law of God alongside of Ezra as they go throughout this day, this half day of reading together. But then we see the 13 others who were down there identified as Levites. These are religious officials who were going throughout the crowd, perhaps, helping, to, helping the people to understand what's being spoken, helping to translate it, helping to interpret it. This is probably an interactive kind of occasion. 
all built around the value of understanding God's word. The people here are committed to listening, but they're committed to understanding as well. And as they understand God's word, we have a model here for ourselves that we might just think about in our own lives and what it looks like for us to understand. We have so many advantages today. Again, in the whole spirit of resources, I can look at my phone and I have commentaries on here. I have lexicons from Greek and Hebrew and all kinds of nerdy stuff. But we can also download apps like the Bible app, the YouVersion app that has all kinds of resources and helps for us to be able to understand God's word. But we still need the community. It's in the community that I I learn from you. It's in the community that I, I hear what stands out to you and your own insights. The ways that God's word applies to your life that I wouldn't even think about in my own situation. We need the community to sharpen each other and to help each other better grasp what God's word is actually communicating to us. And here we see that commitment. But we need to be honest about this pursuit because grasping God's word can be a lot of hard work. At least that's my opinion. Now sure, we can understand the major contours of God's gospel. We can understand who Jesus is and what he has done on our behalf. But a lot of God's word is really difficult to try to understand. It just takes effort. It takes a lot of work to try to figure out what this text actually says because it's an ancient document. It's written to people thousands of years ago in different languages and different cultures. So maybe it's helpful for us to remember, to realize that as Ezra is reading this in their own day, it's also an ancient document. He's reading from the law of Moses that may have been written as many as a thousand years before his own day, his own time. So it still required a lot of effort to try to figure out exactly what was being said, what was being communicated. So is it worth the effort? Well, we see that it is for them. If you look back earlier in the passage, look at just some of these things that are pointed out. Ezra is standing on a platform that was built for the occasion. Right, these 13 people to stand with him were recruited to be a part of it. The 13 Levites were enlisted to be a part of it. So there's 26 other people at least who are a part of the effort. But then the text just reemphasizes that Ezra is standing above and that as he opens it in the sight of all of the people, they bless the Lord, the God of heaven. Why? Because they have a high reverence for God's word. They understand that this is the word of God and as the word of God, it is worth the effort for them. So that's all the groundwork where we see their commitment now that's gone from building the wall to now a renewed commitment to listening to God's word and to understanding it. And because of those two commitments to listen and to understand, now they are in a position where they are about to be transformed by a fresh look at where their true security comes from. Let's keep looking at the text. It says, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept. And they, and they heard the words of the law, Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and set portions for anyone who has nothing ready for this day is holy to the Lord and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people saying, be quiet for this day is holy, do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood, there's that word again, the words that were declared to them. It starts off by saying that the Levites were the teachers, but the word there is actually, they cause the people to understand. Those are the fifth and sixth repetitions of the word understood that we see in the passage. They they understand, and because they understand, they are now in a position to respond. But their response is to be broken. Their response is to mourn, to grieve, to weep over what they hear. 
We don't know exactly what they heard or exactly why they're weeping, but I don't think it's much of a mystery. They're coming to a renewed awareness of how out of step they have been with God's ways. They're coming to understand that their lives have been lived in a way that is not congruent with the way God would have them to live. And maybe they're also coming to understand all of the blessings of God that they have missed out on. We don't know again, but maybe they looked at Exodus 19. Exodus 19, in fact, has a lot of similarities in terms of just the spatial arrangement of things between what's happening in this passage. Exodus 19, Israel's camped out around Mount Sinai. This is a thousand years earlier or so. And Moses is up on the mountain um, communicating with God. And the people are down below at the base of the mountain. So Moses is on high receiving the word of God and the people are down below right after a miraculous work of God. In one case, rescuing people out of Egypt. In the other case, the rebuilding of Jerusalem's wall. So there are parallels here. But what's going on in this passage is Israel's receiving this promise that says, now from God, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We might just imagine as these people are hearing these words about all that God has offered them, they might just be grieved over how much has been squandered in the generations of unfaithfulness. It's like if you find out that your family a couple generations back had great wealth and now there's nothing to show for it. It's just just disappointment over what's happened. But this is of a scale that far exceeds that because this is a whole group, a whole community of people that God had offered to bless his treasured possession, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, and they've squandered it. What they're confronted with right now and what God's word has a tendency to do in all of our lives is that it redefines reality for us. God's word redefines reality so that we see that it's not the lack of walls that causes us insecurity in life, but it's our own stubborn independence of God that causes a lack of security in our lives. And they're being confronted with that reality, with that truth right now. And that's what has them mourning and grieving. But it's in that very place of grief that God is meeting them with his grace. Let's look back at the text. It says here, don't mourn, don't don't weep. This day is holy. Why? Because this is the feast of trumpets. It's a feast of Israel's past celebrated when they just happened to be reading from God's law on the first day of the seventh month where they are supposed to celebrate God's grace that has been poured out on his people. It's a celebration of the harvest. It's like a New Year's celebration where they take the best foods that have been given by God and they just indulge celebrating his faithfulness, celebrating his provision, celebrating his grace over their lives. And it's in that very place that they find themselves. So today isn't the right day to be grieving. Today is a day for celebration. And look back at verse 10 and what the text says there. It says, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet wine, send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to the Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. First of all, this challenges our notion of what holiness means. If we think of it as being somber and just serious, this might redefine it for us a little bit. God's holiness here is about celebration. And what's going on here is that the reason they're not supposed to be grieved is because as they're celebrating God's provision, as they're celebrating all that he has given them, there's great joy in that experience. That's what the meal is there to remind them of. And that joy that comes from God's provision or God's grace is something that becomes their strength. But the word for strength can also be thought of as the word stronghold. In fact, in the Psalms, we see it defined that way. Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the the stronghold, same word, the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? 
The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord, says Psalm 37. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. The joy of the Lord is like our stronghold. Do you get it? They're standing in the middle of the city with the walls that they have just rebuilt, thinking that the walls are now the thing that make their lives secure. And what they're finding out as they investigate God's word is that their true greatest threat has nothing to do with an invading army, but has everything to do with God's grace. Israel had a lot of prophets that came to Jerusalem before the walls were broken down. Israel's walls used to be fine before they were knocked down by the Babylonians. And none of those prophets actually said, hey, you better reinforce your walls. You're going to need higher walls. You better make them thicker because the Babylonians are coming. It was always about their lack of faithfulness to God. And here we see that the people are being reminded once the walls are rebuilt that their true strength, their true protection, their true security is found in the joy of the Lord, meaning the joy that comes from God's grace in their lives. And now, that's about to be reinforced through the rest of the chapter. Here's what it says. And on the second day, this is the, the, the next day, the heads of fathers' houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites came together to Ezra the scribe in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month. And that they should proclaim it and publish it in all their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees and make booths as it is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the square of the water gate and in the square of the gate of Ephraim. And all the assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booze and lived in the booze. For from the days of Yeshua or Joshua, the son of Nun, to that day, the people of Israel had not done so. And there was very great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read the book of the law of God. They kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. There's lots of celebration that goes on in the seventh month for Israel. The seventh month also includes another festival, this Feast of Booths, or sometimes referred to as the Feast of Tabernacles. The people are... They're supposed to go camp in their own backyard, essentially. What they're doing here is they're, they're taking branches of trees and they're constructing little temporary shelters that in part are meant to remind them of how God protected and provided for his people during the wilderness wanderings. So they're there in the city of Jerusalem with, again, the newly constructed walls living in these little Shelters that they just constructed with branches, trying to remember the high watermark of God's security and protection over his people. These are shelters that could be blown over by a stiff gust of wind. And that is supposed to remind them of the security and protection of God, not the walls that are surrounding them. What we see is these people are being reminded because of their commitment to listen to God's word, their commitment to understand God's word, and now as they're learning to respond to God's word, they are understanding that their commitment to God's word is actually how they are discovering what their true security is, where it comes from. I don't think many of us in this room are probably in danger of constructing walls for ourselves, thinking that our lives might become more secure. But we might be in danger of some other things. Tim Keller, who I quote too many times, but he's a pastor who shares this great story about a mentor of his named Dr. Addison Leach. And Dr. Leach is himself a college professor. And he tells about a time where Dr. Leach had two female students who were top bright students who came to him and they had just become believers. And here's how the story goes. They both became Christians and both decided that they were going to become missionaries. And their parents had a fit 
One of the mothers called Dr. Leach, thinking that Dr. Leach was one of the reasons that the girls had become, in the mother's words, religious fanatics, rather than pursuing the course they had hoped, getting a career and having security. Instead, they were going to go wildly off into the blue. The mother said, we wanted our daughter to get a master's degree, start a career, get something in the bank so she could have some security. Dr. Leach responded, please just let me remind you of something. We're all on a little ball of rock called Earth, and we're spinning along through space at zillions of miles per hour. I don't know if that's technically true, but even if we don't run into anything, eventually we're all going to die, which means that under every single one of us, there's a trap door that's going to open one day, and we're all going to fall off of this ball of rock. And underneath will either be the everlasting arms of God or absolutely nothing. So maybe we can get a master's degree and get some security. But the biggest savings account in the world cannot stop cancer. It cannot stop traffic accidents. It cannot stop broken hearts. It can't give you anything, any of the things that only God can give you. He's the only significance you can have. He's the only love that you can get and cannot lose. Or to put it in the terms of Nehemiah, God's grace is like the surrounding walls of protection that no human hands can build. And because no human hands can build it, no human hands can knock it down. It's our greatest security. When we commit ourselves to God's word, to to listen to it, to understand it, and then to respond to it, we commit ourselves in that way, then we discover the true security of God's grace. We discover that God's grace is something that that protects us actually in all of our lives from the biggest problem we could possibly face, which is not an invading army, not a dwindling bank account, not a career that seems uncertain, but our greatest threat is the threat of our estrangement from God, and that has already been addressed by Jesus Christ. When we commit ourselves to God's word, it makes it possible for us to see our world and our lives in this way, and it makes it possible to see that our greatest security is actually from the hand of God. His are the walls that protect us through all of life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word that is worth the commitment, that instructs us, that informs us, that teaches us, God, a word that you desire for us to understand. God, I pray that we would see from it this morning that you are our only true source of security, that you are the one who protects us from our greatest danger, and you are the one who delights to give us the security that we long for. Lord, I pray we would find it in you. And I pray, Lord, that you would make aware in us ways where maybe we have tried to find security in other things, Lord, that that would become apparent to us and that we would just turn from those things, turn from those attempts to find security in other places and other things and other ways, and instead that we would turn into your strong and loving arms. We pray this all, Lord, for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen.